Good morning, um, friends of the media and um, other colleagues in industry who have joined uh, on this call. Um, since the election um, of 2020, uh, we haven't had a major conversation or a policy statement uh, on the power sector. But we also recognize that this is perhaps one of the most important sectors of the economy that we need to get right if we are to shape industry, which is to shape um, the economic life uh, of our people. So we are taking the opportunity today uh, to share our thinking uh, for, you know, revamping, if you like, or retooling uh, the power sector uh, for the next uh, four years. The key actions that we expect uh, government uh, to take based on our assessment of the situation as it is now. And it is our hope that um, government will listen and act because what we have seen uh, for the past one decade that we have existed, a lot of the issues that we have been talking about has been recurrent. We keep saying the same things, um, granting interviews on the same issues. Our position has always been that the power sector uh, is a system, all right? So if you want to fix a system, you don't pick one part of it, but you focus on addressing the entire value chain. So it is not enough to have generation. You need to have um, a robust transmission system. And ultimately you need to have efficient distribution system because if not, the power that will be sold, uh, you can't one recover uh, uh, the cost uh, on in the value chain and also be able to uh, uh, meet the financial needs uh, of the sector. So the, the, the failure of you know, Ghana really has been how do you address the issues as a system and not picking the problems as they come and addressing them. And that seems to be our major, major challenge uh, as a country. And if we do not address this challenge um, in the short to medium term, it is going to escalate. It's going to blow uh, in our faces and it will be difficult for us to um, uh, resolve. The financial demand, if it escalates, will be too high. The way we see things, um, debt accumulation in the sector is not going away. And if we go down the trajectory that we are going, we're going to move from mere, uh, um, you know, debt accumulation to severe, uh, you know, escalation of the debt situation in the power sector. And that is why it is important that we pay attention to some of the issues that we are going to raise uh, today. We put together a paper that will be made available to government addressing the specific concerns uh, in the power sector relative to generation, uh, transmission, distribution, and crystallizing that into fixing the financial difficulty that the power sector uh, continues uh, to have uh, in the country. So I would at this point allow my colleague, um, Kojo, who would do a presentation of the issues in that paper and then we will have a conversation around it. And hopefully we should be able to, as much as possible, answer the key questions you would have uh, for us today uh, to ensure that together we can think through the challenges we have uh, in the power sector. So could you, I'll hand over to you at this point. All right, uh, thank you very much then for setting the context for the discussion that we're going to have today. So just go ahead and share my screen. Yes. All right. 
So uh, this whole conversation, uh, we're going to have a look at the whole uh, power value chain, like uh, Ben indicated. We're going to look at the power generation issues that we have. And in that, we'll boil down to conventional energy generation, renewable energy generation, the fuel supply for power generation, and the emerging LNG issues uh, that are coming up. Then we we'll move to the power transmission sector and finish on the power distribution issues. All right. So we, we acknowledge, uh, like Ben indicated in the beginning, that, I mean, um, <clears throat> the economy will require a very stable, efficient, and cost-effective uh, power supply that would uh, fuel um, economic development and support industrial uh, growth. And it's also uh, very important for the recovery of the economy from the impact of the COVID uh, pandemic. Now, this presents um, significant opportunities and challenges that should um, receive particular focus and attention by government. And to that extent, policy decisions will have to reflect an understanding of the opportunities and the challenges in the power sector. So what we've done is to review the sector, highlight some of the key issues that requires priority attention and propose some critical actions that should not be missed in the policy direction of government. Now, on the conventional energy side of the power generation, we noticed that installed generation capacity had significantly increased um, over time, especially between 2015 and 2020. We currently have um, installed capacity of 5,172 megawatts and um, dependable generation capacity of 4,695 um, megawatts. And that uh, leaves us with a capacity gap of uh, 1,891 megawatts of, on paper. I would explain later why we say on paper. <clears throat> While this um, um, mismatch in demand and supply exists, the outlook for the next four years shows further increases in capacity with the introduction of Amandi and phase one of bridge uh, power. Now the government has indicated in its communications that it pays about $40 million a month for the excess uh, capacity that is, it produces. Uh, we at ASEP are unable to independently verify this claim because the excess capacity invoices of each plant um, are not available. Again, if you do a close monitoring of the generation systems, it shows that the periodic unavailable unavailability of some of the generating plants should significantly reduce the invoice for the excess uh, capacity charges. Now, government has um, indicated for time, uh, time and again over the period that it is uh, negotiating uh, PPAs to relieve the country of excess capacity charges. Um, we, we see, we however do not see any transparency around the negotiations that are being had on these uh, PPAs. And the recent um, 134 million ju judgment debt against the government over the termination of the uh, power agreement with GPC Limited is only an indication of the poor judgment that has characterized such negotiations, the result of opacity 
that paid limited attention to the contract uh, terms. So it is only surprising for us that the president reiterated these same renegotiations of PTAs in his uh, State of the Nation address to uh, Parliament this week without reference to the significant waste that the negotiations and terminations have begun generating as in the case of the judgment debt to GPGC. So on conventional energy, we, we, we uh, demand that government must provide information on the excess capacity that uh, we have based on the availability of the, based on the declared availability for each of the plants for which excess capacity charge is paid for uh, so that uh, we, we can have some credibility around the numbers that uh, government has been throwing around as payment for excess uh, capacity. Government should also prioritize the conversion of single cycle plants, particularly the KTPP and AMERI plants, which are still in the early stages of their life cycle to combine cycle plants to improve the production and cost efficiency that would ultimately translate into uh, lower consumer tariffs. Uh, and then we expect government to be transparent about the never ending negotiations of PPAs and ensure that they are meticulous to avoid judgment debt for energy that sadly is never consumed by the taxpayer. Now we move to the renewable uh, energy end of the power generation uh, spectrum. We notice that government's actions on renewable energy has been um, impacted uh, negatively by the excess capacity uh, charges. So government has, um, suspended PPAs for renewable energy uh, projects to, um, to, allow for to allow for the negotiations that it says it, it is doing to reduce the excess capacity burden and has now extended that suspension to licenses for embedded uh, generation which are essentially private arrangements between renewable energy suppliers and their consumers. All of this is aimed at sustaining demand for grid electricity to account for the excess capacity over time. Even though increasingly renewable energy is becoming a more competitive option for small businesses. Government has demonstrated policy inconsistency on renewable energy generation. It is curious to note that while the directive to suspend the issuance of licenses for embedded generation is in place against private businesses, government has issued another directive to ECG to conduct an auction for 100 megawatts utility scale solar PV power capacity. This uh, policy inconsistencies has implications for the actors in the entire renewable energy value chain. For suppliers or businesses engaged in supplying renewable energy technology and their, for embedded generation, um, they, are, they are unable to apply for their uh, licenses for the new, either new or renewable renewal of licenses in spite of the investments that they have made in their businesses over time. So essentially, these businesses are being paid, punished for no crime committed, even though they are established businesses in this country and are employing people and paying taxes. Again, the policy inconsistency exposes government's commitments to renewable energy penetration and climate action. We have witnessed that there have been consistent defaults on the targets for renewable energy in the national 
energy supply mix. The target was for 10% renewable energy in national uh, energy supply mix by 2020. Uh, by the end, by December 2020, renewable energy generation was less than 1% of the energy supply mix. Consequently, we see that the timeline to achieve the 10% has been revised to 2030. And then on power consumers, uh, particularly small scale businesses, they are denied the opportunity to make rational economic choices between consuming power from the grid and embedded generation from renewable energy sources. Now, the directive to um, suspend the issuance of licenses to, uh, for embedded generation only demonstrates um, the excessive regulation that the renewable energy space is currently ex experienced, especially for embedded generation that ordinarily does not interfere with the national grid lines. And this action uh, questions the logic as to why diesel generations can run either as primary or backup generation without licenses, but renewable energy um, cannot. We expect that government would immediately lift the suspension of the insurance of licenses for embedded generation in the interest of climate action and the energy transition government should be seen as the one encouraging the penetration of renewable energy instead of um, actions to impede it governments must also be more focused on ensuring the regulation of standards especially for um, renewable energy uh, technology rather than the economic choices of businesses and power consumers. Now on full supply for uh, power generation, we have seen that um, gas, especially for power generation has significantly increased over time. And this has caused um, thermal generation in the country to shift from liquid fuels to natural gas. This um, increases in gas supply is accounted for by increase in domestic ga gas production from 10 in 2016 and OCTP or Sankofa in 2018. Nigeria gas has also been relatively stable and that complements domestic gas with an average flow rate of 60 mm scarf in 2020. However, um, there still exists the, even though the switch to gas provides a cheaper fuel option relative to liquid fuels, the challenge of non-payments for fuel in the power sec sector value chain uh, still persists. So the, the OCTP gas um, was not paid for on schedule from inception, which warranted the drawdown of the entire 100 million escrow provided for, by GMPC for gas uh, purchases, except as um, in the past written extensively on some of these uh, issues. What we see is that the government has since paid a significant part of the OCTP invoices. Um, from the consolidated fund and the cash waterfall mechanism. Uh, even with that, the OCTP partners are still owed four months uh, invoices, which amounts to about some $200 million. Uh, Again, as a result of a controversial clause in the gas sales agreement for OCTP, Ghana is obliged to pay penalties for not prioritizing OCTB gas if it can be proven that the country could have done so. And as at 
August 2020, this penalty stood at $40 million. So this presents a case of double jeopardy for the country where the country has to pay for this penalty as well as redeem the take or pay uh, liabilities. So we see that the, the successful switch to natural gas has been enabled by a, a set of actions that took place after several debates. And the OCTP partners financed the OCTP partners financed the TTIP projects to the tune of 184 million as a loan to GMPC to allow the reverse flow of gas from the west to the east of the power corridor. And this debt currently sits on the books of GMPC with interest payments of about 11.69 million in 2020. Again, car power ship was relocated from Tema to Secondi to allow the plants to consume up to 90 mm of gas. This relocation was completed towards the end of 2019. Now the emerging LNG concerns. We note that a floating storage regasification unit, that's the FSRE, has been delivered at the thermal port uh, last year to facilitate the supply of, of gas, uh, to facilitate the supply of LNG. Now, the implication of this is that the capacities of domestic sources of gas are being suppressed to make way for the import of LNG. So OTP, for example, has been suppressed the take or pay volume of 171 mm scarf when the 7.7 .7 billion investment can deliver up to 240 mm scarf without additional investments. Now, OCTP makeup gas, which is gas that we've paid for due to the take or pay commitments but have been unable to consume has also been deferred to 2022 instead of 2021. We must note that Ghana is required to consume that gas or lose it in five years, starting from 2018, which was the effective period for the contracts to take place. Jubilee, Jubilee and 10 has also been capped at 120 mm scarf. The suppression does not only end at the domestic source. There are also plans to suppress supply from Nigeria gas, which is cheaper than LNG from 60 mm scarf that it is currently doing to 30 mm scarf starting somewhere this year. Now, beyond the fact that the LNG would be excess gas, it also appears to be the most expensive gas terminating at the Bernat at about $11.1 per MMBTU based on the pricing formula in the gas sales agreement that uh, is available to ASEP. This shows that the LNG would cost about $3 per MMBTU more than the cost of Nigeria gas. And this makes it unreasonable to want to suppress Nigeria gas at a time that we all agree that it has proven to be very stable. Now, apart from GMPC, who is the off-taker of the LNG, there appears to be very little industry support for the pursuit of the LNG commodity. ASAP has done some work um, on uh, the industry perspectives on the LNG, and uh, we will share that work with you for your perusal after this uh, conference. Gas, uh, GMPC maintains that they have a market beyond Ghana for LNG exports. 
Now we have done a scan of the regional dynamics in a three-year horizon, and we do not see any optimistic demand for gas in the neighboring countries. We can also confirm that there is no single binding contract between GMPC and any potential consumer of the LNG to warrant the corporation taking the risks to contract the commodity. By July this year, a minimum of 75, which will cost us about 300 million, will be delivered from the FSRU. Now, beyond the financial risks that is associated with the LNG, the strategy is also a significant disincentive for investment in domestic oil and gas exploration and seriously constrains the need to accelerate the development of existing gas discoveries. This LNG ambition further burdens the gas sector with multiple take or pay commitments. We already have OCT LNG. The challenges in the gas sector are set to be compounded with the arrival of LNG. This will worsen the debt accumulation of the power sector and the financial situation of GMPC who, unlike in the Nigeria Gas and OCTP um, take or pay commitment that are guaranteed by government, is the sole risk taker of the LNG project. The 300 million financial burden that I earlier mentioned from the 75 mm scarf that will be delivered in July will be too much for the corporation that sought financial bailouts from the state in 2020. On the emerging LNG concerns, we will expect that the priority for government must be the optimization of our domestic gas resources and the suspension of LNG importation plans. This we, we are convinced will reduce the take or pay commitments, reduce pressure on the budget and provide incentives for investments in domestic gas resources. Again, GMPC should be subjected to strict proof for the identified markets that it wants to export to, to warrant the risks of importing LNG into the country. We, we admit that the FSIU has already been delivered. Now, Ghana should negotiate with Nigeria Gas to use the FSIU as a buffer to smoothing gas supply, supply through WACP. The cost of the FSIU can be accommodated in the gas price, which is less burdensome than adding the cost of the commodity which in all likelihood is a surplus requirement. If by 2022, Ghana is unable to consume the OCTP makeup gas, some people should be held criminally liable for deliberately causing financial loss to the state. Now we move to the power translation uh, sector. When we talk about the issues in the power sector, uh, little attention is given to power transmission challenges. Over time, the system has consistently been performing poorly on the basis of transmission losses and voltage violations. Transmission losses in particular has been consistent has been a consistent and recurring challenge of the transmission system over the years. In 2019, for example, the system lost 4.7% of the power generated, which is a 19.4% increase from 2018. 
overall system losses by the end of the first half of 2020 increased to 5.28% of total power generated. These transmission losses are occasioned by the consistent overload of the transmission lines and major voltage violations in major substations due principally to the overaged and weak transmission infrastructure and the inadequate available transfer capacity to meet the demand requirements of the major load centers of Accra, Masi, uh, Takradi, et cetera. These weaknesses in the transmission system have resulted in the inability of the grid to recover quickly during major system disturbances, leading to persistent power cuts and low voltage as have been experienced for the past few months. There is a need for significant investments in expand, expansion, addition and upgrades of the transmission system to improve transmission in the country. The recent nationwide total collapse of the system is a wake up call for the country to begin realizing that it is urgent now than ever for significant investments in the transmission system. Now, for specific actions on the transmission issues, we, as, we acknowledge that the stability, sustainability of grid depends on a reformed power sector that pays for the investments in the transmission of the power sector. The fiscal position of government currently makes it difficult for the budget to continue to sustain investments in the transmission system. So efforts should be focused on reforming the power sector to ensure that payments are made, payment obligations are honored, so the system can on itself invest in the restructuring of the transmission system. In the short term, however, some parts of the ESLA proceeds should be made available for investments in critical equipment in the transmission system. Ongoing upgrade works should also be expedited to relieve power consumers of the frequent outages and low voltage currently being experienced. Now we move to the distribution end of the uh, value chain and the financial uh, challenges that are being faced there. Now the distribution sector is the most significant segment of the power sector value chain for the sub financial sustainability of the sector. The distribution challenges in Ghana's power sector are widely known and has been an area itself has written extensively on. These challenges are deeply rooted in the inefficiencies in the power distribution system. And we can attribute these inefficiencies to obsolete distribution infrastructure and weak revenue collection and management by the distributors. Consistently, Power distribution losses has been the bane of the distribution subsector. In, 20, in the first half of 2020, so in the first quarter of 2020, for example, we experienced distribution losses of 26.63%, which is about 3.4%. 3% higher than the regulatory benchmark of 23.2%. This shows that the problems in the sector are deeply rooted and requires significant attention. It was because of these challenges that governments decided to use the second compact of the Millennium Challenge Compact Funds for the transformation of the power sector by 
an ECG financial and operational turnaround project through private sector participation agreement. This led to the infamous PDS. We all know um, the issues that have come up from PDS. ASAP has written extensively on the performance of the power con uh, compact, and that can be found on our website. So we see that the objective of investing the funds from the power compact to improve the efficiency of the power sector was not realized. And that led to the um, suspension and further termination of the concession agreement with PDS. The government, while terminating the concession agreement with PDS, indicated its commitment to a concession restoration and restructuring plan to be executed within the timelines of the private sector participation process. And in any event, before December 31st, 2019. We can confirm that there has been no action to inject the needed investment, which was determined to be a minimum of $500 million in 2014. So almost a decade since the decision was made to attract private investment into the power uh, distribution sector, we have been unable to realize this goal, largely because of the political in interference that always interferes with the process. We also note that the distribution sector contributes significantly to the power sector's consistent failure to honor its payments and debt obligations, which subjects the sector to deep financial distress. The recently introduced cash forward, cash waterfall mechanism has proven as predicted by ASEP to be an ineffective solution to the financial challenges in the sector. The mechanism only distributes what has been collected by ECG without any connection to addressing the germane inefficiency issues in the power value chain. So far, the mechanism could only honor about $592 million out of the $1.3 billion obligation that accrued in 2020. I mean, besides the function of ensuring fair distribution of revenue can be and must be delivered by PRC, who is the commercial regulator that imposes the tariff and not a separate bureaucratic enterprise like the cash waterfall mechanism to burden the system any further. We note that in, his, in the President's State of the Nation address to Parliament this week, he mentioned that the government has settled all energy legacy debts in a bid to improve the financial sustainability of the sector. This is precisely what ESLA was set up to do. The challenge beyond ESLA and payment of legacy debts is strong, policy commitment to halt debt accumulation in the sector. Regrettably, that has not happened over the years. On the power distribution and financial issues, we expect government to immediately revert to a transparent process to attract private capital into the distribution sector. If this is not done in the short to medium term, the entire power sector will be in serious distress unless government is willing to sacrifice other socio-economic investments to continue to unsustainably prop up the power distribution sector. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for your audience. And this brings us to the end of my presentation. Um, thank you very much, 
uh, Kujo, that was uh, uh, a good presentation. And uh, I would at this point uh, welcome uh, participants to send in uh, your questions if you have them so that we can um, address. But the summary of the issues that were raised uh, by Kojo uh, is that we are not out of the woods. Uh, the challenges are still here uh, with us. And it's perhaps urgent now than ever for us to focus on addressing the systemic challenges that we do have. Otherwise, <laughs> we will wake up uh, 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 with a major uh, challenge than we have uh, today. So if there are questions, we would um, uh, respond uh, to those questions. You may want to type them into the chat box or raise your hand and we would um, allow you to, to speak. If there are no questions, we can assume that um, we've all understood what we just did and we can uh, close the session. And then I I want to uh, um, announce that mm. the paper on which the briefing was made will be made available to uh, our friends from the media uh, just after this session, so they can uh, peruse the details of the presentation that I just uh, delivered. Mm. All right. So I think there's a question on our expectation for the budget. And I think it cannot be anything different from what we have said today. If you're going to present a budget, you cannot ignore this glaring challenge um, in the energy sector. Because if you keep wasting money, like the injection of LNG that could result in the $300 million, um, you know, unwarranted expense, where else are you going to get money uh, to address the socioeconomic development uh, challenges that your people have? And I think those are precisely the issues that we think government should pay attention to uh, in the budget to propose a transparent process that supports dealing with these problems. Uh, the flowery language and speeches are not resolving the issues. We need actions. We need uh, you know, specific trackable actions that will resolve the problems of the power sector. And that is what we expect uh, uh, from the budget. Is there any other question? And I also want to say that the recording of this video will be um, on our Facebook wall and you can pick portions that you want. Um, we have over 300 radio st and, uh, stations and a dozen of TV stations across you know, the country. So it may be uh, not practical for us to engage each and every one of you after this meeting. So you can make use of the, um, the video and treat that as our response to your questions. Any, uh, I've seen a hand up. Uh, one second. Okay, so can we allow Kojo Poku to come in? Um, okay, Kojo, can you unmute and come in? Okay, Ben, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um, thank you for uh, um, the brilliant submission done by your colleague, Kojo. And um, the question I have is, um, 
CSOs have many a times made some of these submissions and um, we try to drive home the need for government to listen to some of these submissions that you've put forward. Um, our friends in the media are the ones that help us carry this information forward. But in the area, like you mentioned, the LNG, if government still goes ahead, or let's say GMPC still goes ahead with this um, unnecessary offtake of this LNG, what are some of the remedies available um, if basically after all the, um, what I wouldn't call it annoyance, but somebody will say, look, after all the CSO's noise, GMPC still want to go ahead and do it. What are some of the remedies available to CSOs to make sure we can stop up, we can stop some of these waste in the system? Thank you. Yeah, I think Kojo, that is um, the same question I have uh, in this space because increasingly you can have your say and nothing happens. And we have proven time and again that exacting or extracting accountability has become a real challenge. And that is why debt you know, piles and nobody gets punished, you know, for it. And glaringly, we see that an additional gas imported into Ghana is further going to worsen the financial situation of the sector. All right. So we have to keep highlighting the issue and ensure that uh, we do not bring this uh, uh, upon ourselves. Uh, could you, if you want to add something more to it. I see um, Morris Ogbiti's hand up. Uh, Morris, you can go ahead. Morris, you can un unmute and uh, ask your question. Um, okay, we, we, we are okay. not hearing from Mark. Maybe we can get Alexander Ibois to go. Um, Alex. Yeah, good morning, yeah. Yeah, good morning to everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, thanks for your presentation. My concern has to do with how you attempt or you intend to influence legislation. Because most of the times, some of these things end up as advocacy. And in as much as you try to push through, um, it probably doesn't end up um, where it's supposed to. That is for our lawmakers to actually push government to implement such concerns. So I want to know if you have steps in place to actually get to a point where you can you want we're losing you um all right we, we, we we're losing you Alex. I'm, sure, I'm sure if i got your question you um asking how we can influence legislation uh, with this position. Uh, I think what we are seeking to really influence immediately policy actions uh, and not legislation. Um, there are decisions that government can take uh, per the mandate of December 7th, and therefore uh, you don't need a law to really act. And the essence of this engagement really uh, is to ensure that um, you in the media will help uh, in the advocacy and sharing you know, light on uh, this kind of, um, you know, if you like, unwarranted uh, uh, commitments that ultimately you will have to pay. When they tell you that we have paid, ask them how did they pay it? You paid through the pump uh, because there is a SLA levy uh, that you have to pay at the pump. On your electricity, there is extra levy. So 
if the debt is accumulated, they will impose levies and then turn around and say we have paid. So we have to ensure that we don't allow these kind of um, reckless uh, commitments to persist. If they do, it's the citizens who will have to pay uh, ultimately. So for you in the media, uh, our hope really is that you will be able to drill down the issues, sustain the conversation. Uh, it sometimes hurts that it becomes a news item and nobody wants to do journalism on issues that sustain it until the results is achieved. So we are called once in a while to comment and then the news is captured, end of story. The state move on to lose money and we are all happy to contribute subsequently uh, to resolve the problem that could have been avoided if all of us with our microphones and with our voices had been uh, uh, committed to following through the issues and pushing uh, proper political decisions, we wouldn't really uh, uh, be in that situation. I mean, if you track the LNG conversation, we have been on this uh, since 2015, when the past government was signing three LNG contracts, when even at the time that we had challenges with gas, it was obvious that all that we needed at the time was uh, a, a, an LNG infrastructure that allows us to play on the uh, spot market. The government in 2017 said there were too many contracts. We didn't need the LNG. All of those LNGs were canceled and now a new one is introduced with the same consequences after we have spent $7 billion uh, on the ENI project to bring on domestic gas. If you check the POD of uh, Ake Energy, Ake Energy says there is no market for our gas. So they are rather proposing a new solution uh, to, to, to use the gas for reinjection and other uh, disposal measures. So if we continue to behave this way, we are not optimizing our domestic resources. We are not encouraging investment. And encouraging investment into our domestic gas market ensures that we are creating jobs, we are creating allied businesses uh, that will empower the Ghanaian. If you import LNG in the face of obvious uh, uh, abundant gas, what are you going to get? You're only improving the market condition uh, in other countries. And the worst of it even is that the LNG is far expensive than uh, uh, the domestic gas and the Nigerian uh, gas when it terminates in Tema. So these are challenges that should be obvious to any politicians. But how, you know, these can be ignored and pursue this kind of agenda that, you know, uh, 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 burdens uh, the, 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 the ordinary citizen. It's difficult to fathom, really. And it comes back to lack of accountability. Because nobody will be held accountable, ultimately, when these unwarranted debts occur. And we keep paying, we keep paying, we keep paying, we keep paying. A billion budget uh, uh, invoices are presented by the power sector, and we pay it. Nobody cares. And subsequently, another one will come, and we will pay it. We have a contract to ensure that we pay for the seven billion investment. We have been paying for the gas through the budget. And even at one point, the controller was complaining that the, the, the money that should be going into social investment are being used to pay for gas that we are not using. So we have substantial gas that we have paid for, okay, sitting with ENI. And the contract allows us to take that gas within five years instead of focusing on that to consume the minimum take or pay and then ask for the makeup gas to be produced for us. We are suspending that, shelving our investment in the gas on the ground and then importing gas. I struggle to appreciate that. I struggle to make sense uh, 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 of that, you know. So the media has a role to play. How do you pick on this conversation to really sustain it and ensure that we can exact accountability uh, from uh, politicians. GMPC says that, oh, there is a market in Benin. There is a market in Togo. They are in conversations with uh, uh, consumers domestically to be able to uh, consume the LNG when it comes. Ask the question, where is the contract that shows that somebody has committed to buy the gas before you import it in? Because it's not a commodity or a gold bar that when you import, you can go and hide under your bed waiting to sell anytime anybody wants. These are huge volumes of commodity. 
If you bring it and you don't sell it, you lose the money. All right. So you cannot bring in a commodity hoping that somebody will want to pay for it. And we are too experienced to engage in this kind of jokes. <laughs> you understand? That is what happened with the power sector when we were hinting that we were inching towards excess power uh, generation back in 2014, 2015, when we kept signing PPAs. We said the market in the West Africa subregion doesn't exist for the amount of power that we were adding on. And politicians kept saying that, oh, we are going to export power, we're going to export power. Now we are complaining about excess capacity. Nobody is held accountable uh, uh, for it. And it's the same thing that we are doing with the LNG and nobody gets uh, uh, held accountable for it. You know, So it is in your court, the media, to help sustain this conversation and stop this kind of reckless uh, 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 burden of the national purse. You look at the budget that was read before the election and you realize that out of the revenues that government expect to raise for the three months or the first quarter that was presented to us, you take out debt service, you take out uh, 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 amortization, and you take out, out recurrent expenditure on salaries, there is nothing left for development. So if you are committing Ghana to some of these expenditures, we are going to borrow to go and pay for them. I mean, we cannot watch this continue happening. And all of us have to participate, not just in the news and help hearing my voice uh, on your airwaves, but sustaining the conversation and extracting accountability uh, from uh, policymakers. Um, Pius' hand is up. I will allow you to uh, ask your question and maybe we can um, end it here. So Pius, if you want to come in. Hello, Pius. Um, okay. All right. Um, is there any other question we have to address? Then there's a question in the chat box. Okay. So let me read that. Um, All right, so I think there is a question as to what our recommendation will be uh, for government to try other sources of energy. And what we are told uh, uh, that our major problem is the power sector has to do with funding. Would it be prudent at this time for government to increase taxes on petroleum products? Or how can we raise funds to avoid those cash trap situations? Well, I think the the other sources of energy um, that are available to us, I mean, in the, within the context of energy transition, um, is renewable. And, you, you know, if we, at this point, are passing administrative fiat uh, that imposes restriction on the rights of businesses to adapt to renewable energy, it, it clearly shows that we are not honest with the rhetorics about, oh, we are adding generation, we are adding more power from renewable sources here and there. And that is what Kojo spoke about. There is now a directive that if you are a business, like a media house or a, a small scale business, and you want a company to come and install uh, solar panels on your facility, government says they will not allow you to do that. And from the work we have done, and tracking policy across the world. It is strange, to say the least, for government to now begin to regulate the economic options available to businesses. Because if a business is not interfering or taking power from the grid or seeking to connect to the grid, what business does government have to say that you cannot use renewable energy to support your business? Particularly when you can prove that is the cheapest uh, form of energy to actually use at this point in time. So that is the administrative fiat that we have. 
And that is a consequence of the uh, overregulation of the renewable space as we have it. Today, you can buy a generation, uh, a genset, and buy all the diesel in the world and run it in your home, in your business. Nobody cares about that. But when I'm going to buy a solar panel to come and put on my roof, government says, no, I cannot do that for my business. I mean, that really, we struggle to appreciate and to see the, the, you know, the, the rationale for that kind of embargo. And we think that it has to go. What government should do is to focus on regulating the efficiency of panels, efficiency of generation systems that are coming into the system. And that can even be done by the, uh, 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 the regulatory authority in charge of standards, the standards authority, really, to ensure that the panels that are coming in, the batteries that are coming in are of a good standard that citizens will generate value by adapting them and not to stop them from exercising their economic right when they are not interfering with government infrastructure. That we struggle to appreciate. And I, I, I mean, we will have a stronger conversation even on that. If possibly we'll have to go to court to stop that from happening because it's a slap on the face of a conversation around energy transition and the need to be just and be prudent to how we manage uh, uh, the climate uh, into the future. Um, the debt situation and the financial challenges, already we are paying, okay, through the pump and electricity tariff. The ESLA is our money. It's the money of the ordinary citizens who take truck, truck, uh, fuel their car, who are paying for what we call the legacy debt. The legacy debt, we are told, has been wiped off. But the debt accumulation is even now burdensome. The new debt that we are generating is even more burdensome. So you have ESLA that initially was supposed to be a short-term instrument for citizens to pay and wipe off the energy sector debt. It has now become a definite, indefinite uh, uh, funding structure that government is happy to create the waste and will continue to pay uh, through uh, the ESLA. So we cannot hope that an extra uh, tax or burden will be imposed on citizens to continue to pay for unwarranted debt that is being uh, generated uh, uh, in the energy sector. We, what we need to do is to really be transparent, prevent government procurement. You know, you go to ECG, you go to uh, Gridco, it's government that is doing the major procurements. The ministries are the ones doing the major procurements in those uh, 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 agencies. They have to allow those people to do their own procurement and be accountable to government for uh, uh, the procurement they do in their businesses and allow them to be independent to deliver their job. That is what can transform the sector and wean it from the recurrent uh, uh, debt accumulation that we are happy to live with uh, uh, as it is shaping up with the ESLA. All right, so I think we can end here. Could you have you seen any other question, question you want to answer? I saw Maurice uh, come back. I don't know if he still wants I think to answer the question. Uh, I don't think it's a new. Pius, Pius Han has been up. Uh, he tried uh, asking the question, but we couldn't hear him. Let's try again and see. Pius. Okay. Hello, Benjamin. Yes, yes. Yeah, now we can hear you. All right, good morning. Good morning to each and every one of you. Good morning. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great. Hello? That's Piles. Go ahead. We can hear you. Piles, please go ahead. We can hear you. Um, that's fine. All right, so great. For But we've had um, industry players complain about the uh, inefficiency of TOR and we believe it's largely to be blamed for the energy sector woes we are, we, are, we, are, we are seeing now. Strangely, I didn't see that in the presentation. Is, is that any reason? Do we have any reason for that? Uh, Pius, come again. 
I'm asking that over the years, we've had cause to complain about the inefficiency of toll. And industry players keep complaining that it's largely as a result of the power sector's challenges we are witnessing over, over, the, over the period. And I'm asking that in your presentation, Yauche, I didn't see you mention um, toll in it. Is it, or do we have any reason why? Okay, so I think Tor's conversation is slightly different uh, from this. Uh, we would, in the course of time, have a conversation on all the, power, uh, the uh, energy sector institutions and prefer uh, the way forward for them and how we think Ghana government can restructure them. And Tor certainly will be one of the institutions that we want to be we want to look at. Um, at this. A meeting, we really want to focus on the power sector and the gas sector issues, which are much more germane in our estimation uh, in the uh, uh, foreseeable future uh, for government to address. But we would subsequently tag, uh, 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 speak to all these specific um, uh, agencies that are becoming a burden also on the budget. Because there are conversations to be had on specifically on GNPC, on TOR, on BOST, on uh, Energy Commission, on PRC, on uh, Petroleum Commission. We will take all of them one by one and we'll deal with the specific challenges that confront uh, these agencies and how uh, we can bring them to uh, proper functioning status uh, that in your to the benefit uh, of Ghanaians and the object for setting these uh, bodies up. Right, so at this point, I want to uh, thank uh, all of you for making time to be on this call. As I mentioned, the video will be available. We'll share the link with you. If there is something you missed, you can go back and refer to the presentation. We have already shared the paper uh, with you uh, on this um, uh, call. So you can download it and peruse it. If you have further questions and clarification, I would appreciate that those questions will seek to clarify what you do not understand and not for us to read the statement to you again. Uh, and I think that is really important. We've been struggling with that kind of conversation uh, when people haven't taken time to look at the document to be able to uh, uh, access specific clarification and questions on them. I thank you and I appreciate you joining this call today. Thank you very much. Have a nice day.